Good afternoon, New York. And the show. You can post your question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at TheOrganicView.com. As we continue our special series called The Neonicotinoid View, my special guest co-host Tom Theobald and I will be joined by Dr. Hank Tanicus to discuss his latest research titled The Molecular Basis of Simple Relationships Between Exposure Concentration and Toxic Effects with Time. So I would first like to welcome to the show my special guest co-host, Mr. Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Hello, June. And our special guest today, Dr. Hank Tenekis. Good afternoon, Dr. Tenekis, and welcome back to the show. Good morning, June. Good morning, Tom. Hello, Hank. Dr. Tenekis, could you please tell our audience about yourself and also about your book and why you wrote Disaster in the Making? Yes. I'm a, a Dutch toxicologist. I graduated from the Agricultural University of Wageningen in the Netherlands in 1974 and performed my PhD work at Shell Research in Sittingbourne in the UK. I've worked in Germany at the University of Marburg and the German Cancer Research Center. And I was chief toxicologist at a major contract research organization in Switzerland from 1986 to 1992. And in 92, I established an independent Consultancy for Product Safety Assessment, uh, ETS, Experimental Toxicology Services. Um, I was the secretary of the toxicology section of the Swiss Society of Pharmacology and Toxicology from 1992 to 1998, and a member of the board of directors of the Swiss Register of Toxicologists from 1996 to 2000. I've authored some important papers in the field of toxicological research, such as a chapter in a textbook on cancer risk assessment published by John Wiley and Sons. My interest in, in bees and neonicotinoids started in 2009 when I discovered that the dose response characteristics of these insecticides were very similar to those of genotoxic carcinogens. And when I realized the implications of environmental pollution with these compounds, I decided to write a book to warn the general public uh, about an impending environmental catastrophe. I think that's, um, uh, in a nutshell, an introduction perhaps to your show. Thank you. Dr. Tenekis, can you please provide some of the background for the development of systemic pesticides? Because I think that's a very important point for many people that are learning about neonicotinoids so that they can understand exactly how we came to be where we are right now. In 1991, Biocrop Science introduced a new type of insecticide into the United States, imidacloprid, the first member of a group now known as neonicotinoids. Bioscientist Albink certified that imidacloprid is the first highly effective insecticide whose mode of action has been found to derive from almost complete and virtually irreversible blockage of postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the central nervous system of insects. Imidacloprid differed from conventional spray insecticides in that it could be used as seed dressings or soil treatments. And when used as a seed dressing, the insecticide will migrate from the stem to the leaf tips and eventually into uh, flowers and pollen. And any insect that feeds on the crop dies. But bees, bug, bubble bees, hoverflies, and butterflies that collect contaminated pollen or nectar from the crop are also poisoned 
1994, Imidacropis was licensed for use in Europe. And in July 1994, beekeepers in France noticed something unexpected. Over the course of a few days, just after the sunflowers had bloomed, a substantial number of their hives would collapse as the worker bees flew off and never returned, leaving the queen and immature workers to die. The French beekeepers soon believed they knew the reason. A brand new insecticide called Gaucho, with the midacloprid as an active ingredient, was being applied to sunflowers for the first time. And in 2001, at the French uh, National Institute of Agricultural Research in Avignon, the group of Luc Belzins and co-workers established an acute lethal dose of imidacloprid of only 40 nanograms per bee, uh, a dose far smaller than for most of the other insecticides. But their important con good discovery was that the lethal dose from chronic exposure to imidacloprid was 4,000 times less. Ingesting one picogram a day was enough to kill a bee within 10 days. Moreover, they showed that imidacloprid is degraded into six metabolites, some of which were even more toxic than the parent compound. And Belzans realized that the very small traces of imidacloprid in the range of micrograms per kilogram of pollen, that's PPBs, parts per billion, constituted a significant risk for bees particularly upon chronic exposure in the beehive. And I was able to uh, explain Belzant's findings in 2010 by showing that neonicotinoids can produce effects at any concentration level, provided the exposure time is sufficiently long. And with my colleague, Francisco Santos Bayo, an Australian ecotoxicologist, I demonstrated that chemicals that bind irreversibly to specific receptors will produce toxic effects in a time-dependent manner, how, no matter how long the level of exposure. So what has happened with the neonicotinoids insecticides is that we've gravely underestimated the risk of chronic exposure of arthropods to these uh, to these compounds, and that got us into uh, a lot of trouble because the insects are declining, the bees are declining, and with the insects being um, an important uh, uh, step in the food chain, a lot of species are in threat or under threat of extinction. Just recently, the uh, United States Geological Survey released a very large database which documents the usage of 459 different chemicals, among which are the neonicotinoids that we're discussing. And what they have published are use maps by year. And if you go back in these use maps to the year previous to the release of a particular neonicotinoid, for example, imidacloprid, and then you advance year by year, what we see is a dramatic and sudden usage of these chemicals all across the United States. And now those beekeepers who are on the receiving end of this are particularly interested in what you're saying about the, the time dose toxicity, because it appears that what we're doing is exactly what you're describing. We've created an environment where at the very least, small amounts are trickled into the system over time, and the bees are picking that up almost daily, and the end point is death, just as you've described. Uh, you've seen those maps, haven't you? Could you just describe your impression of what they represent? Well, I think they're very important information, and you can see that in certain areas of the United States, there's massive use of neonicotinoids. For example, in California's Santo Valley. And in California's Santo Valley, 
Uh, the APA has also established the United States Environmental Protection Agency. That imidacloprid is found in, in nearly 90% of water samples in the Central Valley. So the stuff is leaching from soil and it's also accumulating in the soil and it's only degraded very slowly. Now these are the perfect conditions for long-term long effects of these insecticides. And that is what is in fact happening. The, the insects are exposed to infinitesimal concentrations that we've assumed are safe, but in the long run, they're unsafe, they're lethal. And this is what the dose-response relationship that we've established for neonicotinoids, insecticides, are telling us. You don't need much to kill insects in the long run. You need next to nothing, really. And uh, there is no, not really a, a safe dose level for these compounds. And that's because they cause very irreversible binding to receptors in the central nervous system. And these effects are cumulative. So in the course of time, you will achieve lethal effects because the central nervous system is not working properly any longer. So we have a complete explanation of B decline. There cannot be a shadow of a doubt that neonicotinoids are involved in, in B decline. Certainly, uh, the regulators must be aware of this connection. Have there been discussions with the regulators about this cumulative and irreversible effect in the time-dose relationship, and what do they have to say about that? Well, there's been, there have been reports. For example, the, um, the Austrian Environmental Agency produced a report recently, just prior to uh, the EFSA report, the European Food Safety Agency report on neonicotinoids, and they have more or less accepted my arguments uh, so that in Europe uh, it is now commonly accepted um, that uh, neonicotinoids are an unacceptable risk to honeybees. I'm not familiar with the situation in the United States, and you may be able to tell more about that, Tom. But my understanding is that the, the Environmental Protection Agency hasn't moved on the issue to accept that these uh, insecticides are an unacceptable risk. So um, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about the United States Environmental Protection Agency's stance on, on neonicotinoid insecticides. Yes, they seem outwardly at least to be unmoving. That's right. That's my, my impression too. Well, the trouble is that um, we may think that we have a lot of time left to discuss and evaluate the, the issue, but time is running out. I mean, nature, uh, this uh, recent reporting from the UK shows that most animal species are in deep trouble, and particularly the invertebrates. So um, we're heading for disaster, and there's not much time left to change the situation. That's uh, one of the points that the American beekeepers have been trying to make, and that is that the time that we had has been frittered away. We are out of time. The commercial beekeeping industry in the United States has been bludgeoned into insolvency, essentially, and many of these beekeeping operations will be unable to recover in a single year, perhaps not in several years, and and that would be predicated upon a healthy population of bees and a healthy environment of which we appear to have neither. Yes. Well, I, I recently read that in Maryland, for example, there was 60% losses of, of beehives, and that's uh, uh, the average number. 60%, well, that's unsustainable. That's completely unsustainable, and I, I cannot understand how uh, an environmental protection agency doesn't adopt the precautionary principle in view of these data. I mean, it's surely, uh, surely uh, irresponsible, an irresponsible attitude to a very serious problem.
Dr. Tanakis, could you please take a moment and explain what Haver's rule is and also some of the experiments involving the chemicals that were focused on, including the one experiment involving the mortality of bluegill fish? Yes, sir. Well, Haber's rule is named after Fritz Haber, who was a Jewish and German chemist uh, in, in the early part of the 20th century. And he got involved in chemical warfare, and he was uh, trying to find gases that were lethal uh, within a very short time. And he, um, he had a, a way of establishing the toxicity of uh, these uh, uh, chemicals, which is now known as a harbor's rule. Basically, what, what it boils down to is that if you expose people to a high dose, they will die quickly. And if you expose them to a low dose, they will die after a protracted time period. But in essence, the total dose always remains the same. That's the essence of a harbor's rule. So if I have one, one gram, for example, is needed to kill a person, if I give him that one gram, uh, he will die instantaneously. But if I spread it over a month, the one gram, he will die after a month. If I spread it over one year, he will die after one year. That's the harbor's rule. So the total dose determines the toxic effect. And in fact, it is um, an example of, of a compound where the toxicity is time dependent, but, but where the effects are not reinforced by time, by exposure time, as we see that, for example, with neonicotinoid insecticides. But still, it points to irreversible receptor binding. Many insecticides are following uh, Arbor's rule. For example, organophosphates, carbamates, all follow Harbour's rule. So, and, and that's consistent with irreversible effects. Thank you. Can you also elaborate on what you wrote about in regards to how the toxicity, which is affecting our honeybees, how that understanding of how things work has been misunderstood? Well, basically, um, the, the discovery I made in, uh, in 2009 is a paradigm shift in the science of toxicology. Because our risk assessment is based on uh, the, the Paracelsus par paradigm. Uh, and the Paracel Paracelsus the paradigm is that the dose determines the poison. So it's only dependent on dose, whether a, a, a compound is poisonous or not. And what I've shown for neonicotinoid insecticides is that it is not only a, a question of dose, but also of time. And this is what we've underestimated. And a lot of people are still um, imprisoned by the, 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 par the Paracelsus paradigm and don't realize that there's been a paradigm shift. So, and uh, one, one of the, the, the things is that the uh, paradigm shifts always meet a lot of resistance because um, it's difficult to accept for many people that they had it wrong. And that's what, what is happening. I mean, uh, some regulators are of the opinion that their judgment has been correct. That is really the reason why we have had so many troubled discussions. They don't seem to understand that we need to go back to square one as far as risk assessment is concerned. And if a compound is showing time cumulative toxicity, as we see it with the neonicotinoids, the compound shouldn't be on the market at all. We should ban these compounds. Thank you. Can you also explain to our audience about the residue? Is it true that any concentration whatsoever of residue found in pollen will have a lethal effect um, over time? Yeah. Given time, it will kill the bee. 
Yes, and the only issue is what is the uh, expected life expectancy will be. The concentrations in pollen of imidacloprid that are currently found will kill bees within a bit week. That's an unacceptable risk because bees have a life expectancy of at least six weeks in summer and several months in winter. So the lethal effect would occur within the life expectancy of the bee. And that is clearly unacceptable. One of the things that's been found is that it's not only killing the bees, but it's shortening their life expectancy. And in a superorganism like a colony of bees, just losing a day or two in the life of a forager changes the whole dynamics of the colony and its productiveness and its ability to survive. That's quite correct. Judy Wu has published an interesting study on that topic. Apparently, the, the exposure of brood to neonicotinoids leads to a reduced life expectancy. Now, as I understand it, uh, uh, B will, first of all, work within the hive for about three weeks, after which time it will start collecting nectar and pollen. Now, if you have a shorter life expectancy in summer, then the whole organization of the hive will be in trouble, won't it? Yes, yes. I, I concur with you. I'd like to go back to something that you said about the Central Valley of California because, and also to your puzzlement over the stance of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, you mentioned the water contamination in the Central Valley. And while the Environmental Protection Agency has proclaimed its deep concern over the pollinators, it's doing things that, that are completely out of sync with that uh, supposed attitude. And the first is uh, sulfoxiflor, another systemic that was recently approved. But if we can go back to the Central Valley, in September of 2012, the Environmental Protection Agency approved seed treatment and foliar application of clothianidin, which is a neonicotinoid, on rice. And everybody knows that for most of its life, rice is flooded. It just is astounding to those of us who have been observing that they would approve this kind of use in light of what you've said about the groundwater, the uh, the water contamination situation, because in effect, what's being done is this chemical is being put directly into the water. It's, uh, it's irresponsible because clothianidine is water soluble. So is for sulfoxiflor, so is imidacloprid. Their gas index, which is an index that uh, exp uh, indicates the likelihood of leaching, is very high. So all these three insecticides are very likely to leach from soil. And what we've seen in the Central Valley is that imidacloprid is leaching from soil. And we, uh, we can expect uh, clothianidin and so Foxflow to do very much the same thing. So uh, how on earth can you can you allow a compound on the market that is similar in its uh, environmental properties to a metacloprid? I really can't understand this at all. Dr. Tenekis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I just want to ask our audience to visit your website, which is www.disasterinthemaking.com, where they can pick up a copy of your book, A Disaster in the Making, which, in my opinion, is one of the most important books anybody could read, especially to understand what exactly is going on with our environment, with the massive global losses of our pollinators, and more importantly, to understand the impact on their own health. So I, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Well, thank you, June, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to an American audience. Thank you very much, Tom. It was a pleasure to, to be um, in your show. Thank you, Dr. Tanakis, and we always learn something when we talk. Thank you. And folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>